Hello, this is National Master Spencer Feingold, back at the Chess Club in Scholastic Center of Atlanta. Today we're going to be talking about Doubled Pawns Part 2. This is the second class today on, what is it, Sunday? Yeah, the Sunday class. The first one was supposed to be under 1400. This one's will be over 1400, so it'll be a little tougher. That's about the difference, really. Um, we ended the last game, or the last lecture, rather, with a Smyslov game. So let's start it with a different Smyslov game. Smyslov against Robotash. Robotch. I never knew how to pronounce this name either. Actually, I had this problem in the other uh, other class. If you go and, and watch that video at home, um, or if you're in the audience and you have to watch a video of the first class at home, you know, you don't have to do that. But, anyways, let's take a look at this game. Smyslov has white. Good old English, huh? Robotash is going for like a Grunfeld setup. And Smyslov's playing in an anti Grunfeld way. Bishop e3 this is a flexible move. Notice he's keeping his knight on g1. Exactly for this moment. Takes. Obviously, very double edged decision, right? Gets rid of basically his best piece. That bishop on g2 is his best minor piece or going to be at least. He also gives black the bishop pair. Black has two bishops now. So those are a couple of advantages, but double isolated C pawns on a half open file. Those are really, really weak. Doubled, isolated, and on a half open file. Like all the worst things that could happen to a pawn, pretty much, aside from just getting captured, which probably is gonna happen. Um, so, really double-edged decision. Like I mentioned in the first lecture, in a lot of openings, you give up the bishop pair to ruin your opponent's structure. Both the games in the first um, lecture were Nimzo Indian defenses, where the bishop took the knight on c3, doubling the pawns. So Smyslov, he likes to play against the double pawns. Smyslov loved to have, even though he's a very like solid positional player, he liked to have positional imbalances. You know, he could try to win that way without too much risk. He really understood the position well, and he could... Uh, you know, use those imbalances better than his opponent, or understand them at least. Queen c1 has a couple of ideas, right? Attacking the pawns in the c file potentially, as well as even trading off the dark square bishop, which would get rid of white's bishop pair. Um, and he goes for h5. Don't trade away my bishop pair, right? Black's got the bishop pair, he doesn't want to trade away, he doesn't want to allow bishop h6. So h5, h6 also is a playable move, by the way. And now he goes knight f3. And bishop g4. Knight g5. Yeah, I mean, I guess he would have played bishop f3, queen d3, right? Takes and takes, so let's avoid that. Don't think he wants to play f6, right? Be pretty ugly. And he's just going to try to kick the bishop away, f3 or h3. Yeah. Goes for a knight d5. Yeah. And now, takes it. So, black has two ways to recapture on d5. It's not really a trick question. You know, he is going to recapture, but which way do you think you would prefer? Think about it for a minute if you want. Pawn takes. Mm. What do you say? Uh, pawn. Both pawn takes, right? Fix those double pawns, right? Yeah. Except he did play queen takes. There's a couple reasons. One is like um, a long-term idea. And I mentioned this in the first lecture, if, you, if you're watching that video before this. <laughs> that a lot of times you have double pawns, but even if you get rid of them, you'll still have weaknesses. Right, if you play CD, you'll still have a lot of queenside weaknesses on the C file, C5, and C6, because there's no B pawn. Right, and this is, this is a long-term problem. But also, don't you think he's going to play queen C6 check if you play C takes? Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, he would definitely play queen C6 check. Where you can't block with the queen because your rook would be hanging. If you block with the bishop, your D pawn would be hanging. So you're going to have to play king F8. Not the end of the world, but you might want to castle. And queen takes activates the queen anyway, and with the tempo on the rook. 
So there are definite benefits to playing queen takes, even though it doesn't fix your pawn structure. It has all those other things that I mentioned, pretty much. Attacking the rook, so f3. Not threatening the bishop, but, you know, sort of pretending to threaten it. Might take it some time. So you got to watch out for that. Uh, rook b8. Yeah, at least, you know, he's got those double pawns, but it gives him a half-open file, so he's using it. Attacking the B pawn, so rook B1. Smithsov's playing a little bit uh, a little bit slowly here, but if he gets everything under control, he'll be really happy. You know, he wants to move his king to F2. That'd be a really safe square for the king. Protect his rook on H1 also, so that the bishop on G4 would be hanging. And, yeah, if he gets to double up on the C file or target the A pawn as well on A7, He's going to have easy play on the queen side. And he could try to restrain the two bishops. He's got a lot of pawns on white squares, which is a good start. You know, he's got a dark square bishop, put the pawns on white squares, fight against this bishop. So it's all going to come together for Smyslov unless black can try something to, you know, throw a spur in the works there. Preemptively moves his bishop. Again, it wasn't actually threatened right away. And b3, this is a really nice move. And now I think black misses out an opportunity. He definitely has a, a pretty forcing play he could have gone for, at least. Not that I think Smyslov made a mistake, but black sh still should have done this. You know, Smyslov played okay to allow it, let's say. But what do you think you'd do with black? Any forcing move suggestions? Anyone? No forcing move at all for black? Yeah, check, right? It's a fork. That's what I was thinking, but I didn't. Too scared to say it, I get it. <laughs> but yeah, queen a5 check, it's a fork. It attacks the a2 pawn, which is hanging. What would white do about that? Block with the pawn queen and b3. b3. Oh, you mean b4? You have to play b4? Oh, yeah. Queen d2, I would not suggest. Can we refute queen d2 first? Queen a5 oh, check, queen d2. Bishop c3. Bishop c3, you're right. b4, I'll take it, right? What do you. Just take it. The rook. So, I mean, queen a5 wins a pawn, doesn't it? That's all. He should totally have done that. And Smizov was willing to sacrifice the pawn. That's that's really was the plan. It's not like he missed that. He knew it was alright. Now this pawn's hanging, I think he would just play queen c4. Defending the hanging pawn here. Attacking that. It's a classic way to get the initiative, right? You defend and attack at the same time. That's what the initiative's all about. He sacrificed a pawn, but obviously black has still a terrible structure. Kind of a poorly placed queen as well. And he has to deal with this immediate threat. It's unclear. You know, black also has the bishop pair, but white's position is really good. You know, his king is safe, his pieces are active. He's got everything just like Smithsolve would like it, you know, except down pawn. Wouldn't like that. So that's probably what he should have done. Instead, he never played f6. I mean, he played f6, but never play f6. Well, he wanted to kick the knight away, definitely, but... This move clearly has downsides. I mean, just ask the bishop on g7. Right? Just ask the bishop on g7 what he thinks about it. And, oh no, you you kicked my knight away to e4, a great square. Right? Right in the center of the board, you're going here. 
You know, it's not like he made the knight go to h3 or something terrible. He kicked it right to the center where he's going to c5 anyway. This is a great way to exploit the double pawns. They've got that outpost right in front of them. Double pawns and a half open file are pretty weak. White's already getting in, in some control here. Black just figures, I'll push the pawn again later. I'll just push all my pawns. It's kind of how, it's, how he played. You know, it's his style. But obviously it's a little committal. And it makes a lot of weaknesses. But it does get pretty complicated here. G5. Don't even really understand that move. Honestly. Probably wouldn't have played it. A5. Yeah, I mean, playing A4 would be pretty good. Get to trade away that pawn. Like that. Trade away the A pawns, basically. So he played knight C5 to prevent that. And knight's good on c5 anyway. Bishop c8. Time for a pawn break. h4. This is kind of a nice play by Smyslov. Basically, he wants to define what's going on on the king side right now. It's like, are you going to push? Are you going to take? What's going on? If the h-file closes, then he'll move his rook over to the queen side. But if the h-file opens up somehow, like by black allowing hg, for example, he'll keep his rook on the h-file. So he's staying flexible with his rook. He's going to see how it goes on the king side. And if it closes down, he's going over to the queen side. Pretty good play. Playing on both sides of the board. G4. Now, I think it's pretty clear that uh, a queen trade would generally benefit the side with a better structure. Black might not mind if white trades queens on d5, though, fixing a structure a bit. So he just goes e5. Yeah, the game's getting pretty chaotic at this point. Probably Black thought he wasn't doing too badly here, actually, you know. Clearly going for some breaks on the king. Yeah, goes for knight a4. Now here, probably knight a4 is a mistake. What do you think you might, con how would you might continue with, with Black's position here? Definitely. Definitely. You got a couple of options as far as that's concerned, though. GF, right? Yeah. And then EF, right? Then maybe push the F pawn. And F4, right. GF, right? <laughs> GF, probably. Yeah. Gonna have to do that. Well, it looks like white won a pawn to me. Opened up my king a little, but it looks like he kind of also opened up Black's king. I mean, how is White's king less safe than Black's there? Not clear to me that that's the case, even. It is clear to me that somebody's up a pawn. In that variation. But also, I mean, how would you compare that to if you just played f4 at once? You know, instead of gf, ef. Because that's really what you have to figure out is you know, comparing those two variations. It's a common technique that strong players use when they're looking at some candidate moves. If they're somewhat similar, we just have to compare them. So what if we played f4 first? All right, what if we did play f4 first? G takes, E takes, Bishop takes, that was bad. Maybe Bishop H6. Well, maybe if 
uh, F4 if GF. Don't have to take back right away. I was thinking castles. Or rook f8. To try to put pressure on out in that file that way. We could also compare this if we take on f3 first. Take on f3 first, then play f4. Yeah, difficult to analyze, right? Well, he does play gf and f4. So Misov just takes it, though, like we were saying. I will say the computer really likes to move bishop a7. Yeah, it wants that tempo, like, so bad. Give me a one tempo. So it could play rookie one check. Which is kind of an annoying move to me. This is kind of the problem, actually, with gf, ef. It opens up the e-file. Almost impossible to like figure that out during a game. You know, Robotash is just like, let me bust this open. You know, <laughs> that's basically all he, all he can think about. Can't really blame him. He just goes for takes anyway. You know, I'm not playing Bishop A7. My name's Smizlov. I would never play Bishop A7. But okay, now Rook F8, it's not clear. Robotash did a good job, even though he was like positionally lost on the queen side, of making such a mess of the king side. That, who cares if you're positionally lost on one side of the board? It's just chaotic now. That's sometimes what you have to go for when you have a bad structure. But the position's opened up and he's got two bishops. So it's a pretty logical play by Black. Really, pretty logical play. Obviously he's about to trade queens. Come on. And then, Black to play. Bishop involved. Bishop a6. That's a good plan. I think I can find a better square for the bishop. Just for a tactical reason. make an unstoppable threat, really. Or pretty much unstoppable. Oh, uh, bishop g4? Yeah. Well, you could play f4, though. You could play f4. Yeah, bishops are doing a good job here. If he doesn't harass these pawns, the guy's just going to take the C-pawns, he's going to push his two connected pass pawns. It would be really good for white. But his pawns are a little bit weak. He has to play a passive move, right? Rook H1, not the move you really want to play, but he doesn't want to lose the pawn and give him a protected, I mean a passed uh, H-pawn. That's sort of protected, but... Yeah, don't want to give your opponent a passed H-pawn and lose a pawn. So he's going to have to be relegated to passive defense. This isn't so bad for black. But he does miss the best move here. This, uh, this next move is really why he lost the game. So black to play. Let's see if you can... Oh, I wouldn't really call it defend. Let's see if you can handle black's position a little bit better than... Than Carl. Old Carl. Haha. <laughs> Ro Robot. Robot, maybe. Rook D8. Rook D8, get that rook in, right? Great candidate move. Really good candidate move. Any other candidate moves? Connect the rooks. Get that king up. King yeah. Maybe a forcing move? Candidate forcing moves?
into it? Bishop e5, right? Similar to that bishop g4 from earlier. Right. He'd probably handle it the same way, right? Push. Well, he played rook d8, which is a very reasonable move. Gets the rook in, which he could have done in a more efficient way with a forcing move, rook b4. What about this fork? What would you do if I forked you? Just grab the pawn. Sack the exchange for all the pawns, right? You wouldn't play bishop d4 check? Instead? Saves the fork. Saves the fork. But no, I would take all the pawns. Give me, give me the two connected pass pawns for the exchange. That's fine. In fact, I don't like bishop d4 because after he takes it and plays king e3, I don't really have a great move. I think white's just doing great here. He's got two connected pass pawns. My bishop pair's gone. He's coming home to roost at this point, you know. Finally, the double pawns would be decisively bad. So, yeah, he would give up the guys for the pawns. T take that one, bishop f8, take a check. You can move the king to attack the rook. We play rook check, right? We'll take the bishop at the end. Give me those two connected pass pawns for the exchange for sure. Any day of the week. Not even that bad for black. So I think that Robotash saw this, saw the fork, and thought he would play rook, bishop d4 check. And didn't like that position after trades king e3. And maybe didn't want to take the pawns for the exchange. Although that's, you know, not too bad for black. I'm just guessing, you know, I don't know what he really thought. But I like to try to figure it out. Played rook d8. Looks like a really good move. I mean, he gets the rook in. It's a little slower. You know, in Smyslov, all he needs is a little bit to gain total control. You saw that from the other lecture. He really showed uh, Geller what was what when he had total control of the position. He's trying to play some, what, bishop b7 skewer? But maybe you could even still play rook b6 check. Just goes f5. He's got this idea of bishop g5. Stops that one. Give me that pawn attacking the bishop now. It's already like over. It fell apart so quickly from one passive move. <laughs> yeah, goodbye double pawns. He goes and takes that pawn. It's rude. Oh, check though. Hmm, what's the idea? Well, resigns. Resigning was the idea. Yeah, Smyslov was really took control of the position after just that one passive rook d8 move. Took all the pawns and even was going to take the h-pawn. Robotash's king is awful. Two connected pass pawns. Really sharp, complicated game. Especially in the middle game there with those pawn breaks, the f4 pawn break. But basically, the, the decision at the end with Rook D4, Rook, or Rook D8, or Rook B4 is what sealed the deal for Robotash, Robotch, <laughs> maybe. But all right, yeah, Smyslov knows how to handle his double pawns, and he loved those imbalances. I'll give you the bishop here for a bad structure, you know, that kind of deal. Okay, let's see. How do I, I'll just do it like this. Control to F1. I never remember it. Let's go to the next one, huh? No. Yeah, this game's pretty crazy. I'm, I'm not going to remember to do that. Bodvinik against Sorokin. Uh, yeah, if I didn't know any better, I would not even know that Bodvinik played this game. You know? It's like a really weird one. 
for him. But maybe because his opponent wasn't as strong as he was, he was trying really hard to win the game. So he played in an unusual way. Let's check it out. Well, I wouldn't say he played in such an unusual way till later, actually. Sort of misled you a bit. Classic Queen's Gambit. It's actually a pretty solid opening. Like, a really solid opening. Yeah, the move order is, um, like, an early knight d7. I would say that that's pretty popular nowadays, actually. You see Carlsen do it quite a bit. There's a game I cited here. It was Aronian against Carlsen from 2013. Aronian played rook c1. Not that bishop d3 is bad. Probably dc is a good move here. As in the game, who did I have here? Tigran Petrosian against Bent Larson from 76. So after this game, but before the Carlson game, obviously. Just played C6. So I usually tell my students to avoid this with black. Like, it's sort of a semi-slav formation, but you don't have the benefits of a semi-slav because white got out the bishop uh, to G5 and didn't lose the pawn like you would in a semi-slav, potentially. Here, you just got everything. White just got everything. And black is, like, passive. Like, in a semi slot, this bishop might be here in, like, a Moran variation, you know? Or it might be on g5, but they take your pawn, or you give up the bishop pair in a Moscow variation. So white didn't have to give anything up. He didn't have to lose a pawn, the bishop pair, or block in his bishop. So generally, it's a little bit better for white. Doesn't mean you can't equalize. But uh, you see a lot of people do this, but... Anyway, so castles. He goes for a6. Trying to play with b5, so he plays a4. Yeah, takes, takes. c5. So, so far you guys are probably like, how are they ever going to get doubled pawns, right? You know? This looks like there's no way anybody gets a doubled pawn. Or two double pawns, sorry. Yeah, let's see. Get out of there, he wants to trade those bishops, huh? Alright. Bofinik's not a stranger to simplification, you know? He doesn't mind to grind it out. Threatening the bishop. I mean, White's position looks a little better, you'd have to admit. He's got really good rooks. All his pieces are on, like, the perfect square, right? Meanwhile, Black's a little bit discombobulated with his knights, and his bishop wishes it was out here. Even still, it should be like a minute advantage, really. E4, good move. E5. Here it is, queen E3. I will say that he has like a computer-like move here that's really strong. I think it was, was it rook C2? Yeah, it was rook C2. Okay, so it's... Not the most subtle move, let's say, <laughs> right? He's obviously trying to get some knight business going. For example, I looked at queen a5. Maybe even trying to win the pawn. I'll take a pawn if you let me. Queen e3 does let him. Still knight d5. He'll leave these guys here on the queen side, who cares? I'm going to go for... E pawn, and the king too. I mean, he's got pretty good attacking bishop here, don't you think? It's kind of an amazing bishop. Sort of a problem with e5, by the way. Um, yeah, for example, takes, takes, b5, rook d6. I mean, what if you played rook g6, you know? <laughs> rook g6, queen h6. No, but white has an, an amazing amount of compensation here. Computer even like, says it's winning for white. Wouldn't really be too confident about that. Not that any of this variation was forced, by the way. Even. But it did seem like logical play. But I don't think he was even really seriously considering rook c2. Queen e3 is an unusual move, though. Wouldn't you think? 
like on purpose doubling your pawns for basically no reason right except there is some reasons <laughs> there's a few small reasons that Bafnik didn't mind to double his pawns um, for one because he has a white square bishop and he played e4 he uh, has weakened dark squares you know in the structure and when this structure changes this way, it actually controls the dark squares, so black won't be able to get his knights into f4 or d4 at all. And so this is kind of complementing his really strong bishop on a2. Also, even though he has doubled pawns, both sides have a uh, like symmetrical structure, that is, as far as the majorities are concerned. Nobody has a pawn majority. It's 2 against 2 on the queen side, 4 against 4 on the king side, and um, so that's not as bad as say it was like this and his, he had a doubled pawn on his majority because then you cannot make a pass pawn on the queen side if you have these doubled pawns but black could make a pass pawn on the king side with his pawn majority by breaking f, f5 whatever he wants so like a king and pawn in game this is already lost pretty much but here it's fine neither side can make a pass pawn you know if theoretically nobody loses the pawn so when you have uh, a more symmetrical structure like that, the pawn majorities uh, it won't be so bad for your, your double pawns. Also, it makes Luft as well. Spends a tempo, doesn't even spend a tempo and he doesn't have to worry about his back rank anymore. So he's got a lot of small benefits that these double pawns uh, you know, confer, I guess. Meanwhile, if you look at his pieces, they're all still on beautiful squares. And black needs to maneuver around a bit. I mean, this knight is not well placed. Obviously, he needs to develop his bishop, but these rooks are pretty intimidating. And this pawn is hanging, by the way. Although there might be some, like, rook e8. Well, maybe not, because my double rooks are pretty strong. So, it's a tough position for black to handle. He goes for bishop g4, develops his bishop to the only square he wanted to go, I guess. d7 looks a little bit, a little bit tenuous, right? And knight takes e5 would be strong anyway. So, he pins the knight... Kick. Get out of here. Yeah, bishop d7, a5 would have even won the piece immediately. Or won two pieces for a rook. And yeah, this is really nice on the queen side too. See, so he locked them on white squares. That's bad because they both have white square bishops. And that's good for white on a dark square. And this is still loose. Rook c1 gets out of the pin, threatening knight takes e5 again. So I think he took the guy, right? Yeah. So his double pawns are not even weak. They're never going to be attacked now. They're solid. He had all the benefits and none of the downside. Really good play by Botvinnik to understand all that. I mean, clearly, white's in the driver's seat now. Look at that bishop. That bishop's really good. I wish I had a bishop like that. Takes, takes, you know, knight d5. Trying to get his rook into c7. He said, no. No rook c7. So, all right, I'll play rook d7 then, right? Fine, you know. Dang, doesn't Bob Finnick make it look so easy, too? Like, you feel like I could just, I could just win like this, right? <laughs> you know, I could take, put my rook on d7. Dang. I wouldn't have played queen e3 when he did, though, I have to admit. Just king f2. Implying rook g1 might be in the future, you know. So Sorokin goes, oh, let me take that pawn, you know. I'm gonna play rook g1 anyway. Just kidding. <laughs> Doubled up. You know, that's why Sorokin didn't take the pawn earlier, but... Well, also the b pawn is hanging, I guess. Well, when knight takes, would have defended the b pawn. Yeah, well, you could have played b4 to win it back, so I wouldn't have won it. Doubles it up here. Any suggestion from the crowd? B7. B7? No, never mind. No, never mind. Better. <laughs> Trade a rook, maybe? Rook takes c7? Well, you mean c8? It's white's turn, after all. Oh, that helps. Yeah, I mean, you've got a lot of reasonable moves for white. Bishop of seven check. Bishop of seven check looks pretty good. Even rook f seven. 
You, you could even trade and take on f7 too. Just give me f7. Dang, that bishop on e2 looks pretty good. Check. Woof. Yeah, now Bodvinik was having a great time. I mean, look at his pieces compared to Black's pieces. Dang. Walks the king up, right? I mean, it would be horrible to have Black here, don't you think? What are you even going to do? You can't even hardly move. What do you think about that? Can't take it, right? Bishop would be hanging. It's a move. You know, he's trying, you know. <laughs> right. He's trying the best he can. Any suggestion? H4. Pawn H4? What's the plan there? Yeah, do something. <laughs> yeah, but what's the plan? You know, H4, H5? What about King H4? Wait, you're telling me that you want to move your king up in the end game? <laughs> yeah, King H4. Get the king in there, right? King H4, King H5, King H6, Rook H7, mate. That's a good plan. Probably he'll check you when you get your king up, though. Yeah, double pawns, right? This one, <laughs> the whole point of the lecture. Takes back, keeps the double pawns, but he just wants to keep his bishop on d5, obviously. He doesn't care about having the double pawns now. It's such a clear win. Rook d6. He's holding steady, right? Sorokin's not going down without a fight. What do you guys think? I think I know what he'd play after rookie seven. seven. Uh, knight c six. Definitely, right? You have to do that. Oh, yeah. Wouldn't be the worst. I mean, maybe oh, no. you could still take the stuff, but bishop c or rook c eight. You'd play rook c eight right here. Uh, I'd advise against that. Yeah, because the king's stuck. I mean, all right. Exactly. Yeah, the king's stuck there. Nice. What if you drop the king back to g4? What's the plan, though? Well, then you can uh, reposition there. You start pushing your h-pawn up. But you eventually have to take that pawn on h6. Yeah, but how am I going to do that without my king on h5? But dropping the king back to g4 would protect the pawn on e3. That's true. That's true. Yeah, but how am I supposed to take the h pawn if you're moving your king back? Yeah. That'd be, like, impossible. Who's going to take it? Just the rook by himself? How about, um, b4? Yeah, then the knight's messed up. Well, knight c4, right? I mean, I'd happily give up a pawn, you know... I'd be thrilled to do that, to trade bishop for knight. I mean, the knight on a5 is done. That's a done deal. So I would never in a million years play b4. <laughs> I see what you're saying. <laughs> yeah, he's not going anywhere. Because yeah. it's not really doing anything anyway. 
Yeah, and you're a bishop. Now that's doing something. Yeah. Dang, that bishop. That's been the best piece for a long time now. But yeah, how do you continue? It's not easy. Botvinnik found definitely the most efficient way to proceed, maybe even the only way. This is a really critical moment for his technique. But for somebody like Botvinnik, it's pretty easy. This is like his bread and butter. But he trade rooks. Hmm. He could trade rooks, you know, to try to win the H pawn. It would let the guy's knight out, though. Get out of jail free, am I right? Uh, yeah. yeah, that's true. That'd be seven. Yeah, or even C6. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah, you lose a little bit of control. Bafnik is not about to lose control. Let's see what he did. H3, nothing. Thought he's gonna take the pawn, didn't you? <laughs> I knew it. That's why I was laughing. <laughs> no, no, it does nothing. Why don't you guys play like this, though? All right, same position. Let's see if he finally gets there. There we go. Bishop f7 to g6. And that's his plan. Bishop f7 to g6. Does let his knight out of jail, but. It's going to be made. I think he takes the pawn here. Yeah. Threatening mate in two. All right, so he changed the situation. He let the knight out, although he's still kind of out of the game, honestly. Because everybody's looking at the black king, I bet. But now what? What's the next phase? That's how you would have learned about it. <laughs> he totally could do that. He totally could do that. Probably he would just push his A pawn or something. About drop the bishop back, get ready for rook h7, then bishop e6 mate. Great style there. Yeah, he basically did that in a more forcing way. Bishop f5. Probably rook f6 check, right? That's sort of the problem with that. Okay. Just check. Right. Not that that's bad, you just go back to g6, and then he has to go back. So what, rook h7 first, then? King g8. Obviously. <laughs> King g8, x clan. You got the right idea. Even the right move. Rook h7, king g8, it's right. King yeah, g8, and then I'm trying to figure out if. How do you get the get bishop to that diagonal? Or, or move the bishop back right away. Ah. Uh, that looks like it, right? Uh, king g8, then rook g7 check, king h8, and then drop the bishop back because then you can block with the rook if he tries to check you. Well, but do you want to trade rooks even? Because what about a5, a4, a3, a2, a1? Touchdown. <laughs> but you're on the right track. Let's look. Check. Check. Not bishop f5, though. Uh, bishop f. Oh, bishop h7? Bishop f7, maybe. Oh, I see. Oh, there's you guys are all on the right track here. I was thinking bishop g7, but then the last the rook check, but then you can have the rook. G7? No, no, sorry. Bishop oh. h7. Bishop h7 threatens nothing. Yeah. Yeah, but when you get the h, uh, the rook on g8. This is bishop f7, right? Bishop f7. Oh. Threatening mate in one. 
Bishop F seven threatens mate in one. Mate. <clears throat> yeah, that's how you do it. What the, what's black gonna do now? <laughs> Dang. You guys joke to me? Yeah. Check, check, bishop f seven. It's hard to visualize it. Yeah, definitely. For me. Not for Botvinik. <laughs> Just be as good as he was. <laughs> what else? Now it's a sad day for Sorokin. Easy, easy. Yeah, White has a pretty easy plan here. <laughs> H4, H5, H5, H6, H7. So he's trying to get his knight over to, in to intimidate the pawn. <laughs> but don't play h5, play something better. White's turn. Oh. He's played dot 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 ninety ninety two rook e seven. Or maybe we can move it over further, but you're threatening mate at least. Well, yeah, that's why he played rook d seven. Yeah. Attacking the knight. Yeah. And wait. Wait, that was the easiest tactic of a lifetime. <laughs> yeah, I'd call it a double attack personally, because mate is not like a tangible thing, but it's mate, and the knight. So resigns. Great technique by Botvinnik. Really good technique. You know, he makes the smallest win look like. Well, he did move around and repeat a lot, but you know, he's just marking time and it's always it's good to move around randomly, you know. Like when it was on H pawn was on H two and he moved around randomly here. I don't know exactly when he thought I'm playing Bishop F seven to G six, but it's somewhere in the midst of these rando moves. I thought he was going to take the pawn too, didn't you? <laughs> yeah, then eventually he thought, okay, let me do it. It doesn't hurt to move around randomly a bit. He's in total control. And he was a little bit, like, uh, hesitant because this does let the knight out. But the knight's so far out of the attack. I'm sure he already just calculated that he's winning by force. Because you have to play rook f8, right? Only move to stop mate. That makes sense. I don't think you're going to play rook c6. But then, clearly, it's, he saw this. It was very easy for him. It's a really good technique. And Botvinnik didn't mind to get those double pawns to control the dark squares and accentuate his peace activity. You know, that's the most important thing is peace activity. More important than pawn structure. And, in fact, the bad part about having a bad pawn structure, as I mentioned in the first lecture, is that it limits your peace activity. You have to defend your pawns with pieces instead of pawns. But that wasn't the case for Botvinnik here. And he had everything under control and just squeezed the guy like he was uh, known to. But all right, that's all I have for you today about double pawns. Hope you learned even more than the first lecture. Thanks. Bye-bye.